Alright, hello everyone, and welcome back for the 13th installment of Taoism Explained. There has been a bit of a delay since the last video, so I apologize for that if anybody has been looking forward to this episode. I'll probably make a short video just after this one, explaining what I've been up to. So, as always, I will read three translations from three different sources, and we will talk about some potential meanings. Our first translation goes like this. Favor and disgrace would seem equally to be feared. Honor and great calamity to be regarded as personal conditions of the same kind. What is meant by speaking thus of favor and disgrace? Disgrace is being in a low position after the enjoyment of favor. The getting that favor leads to the apprehension of losing it, and the losing it leads to the fear of still greater calamity. This is what is meant by saying that favor and disgrace would seem equally to be feared. And what is meant by saying that honor and great calamity are to be similarly regarded as personal conditions? What makes me liable to great calamity is my having the body which I call myself. If I had not the body, what great calamity could come to me? Therefore, he who would administer the kingdom, honoring it as he honors his own person, may be employed to govern it, and he who would administer it with the love which he bears to his own person may be entrusted with it. And the second translation goes like this. Favor bodes disgrace. It is like trembling. Rank bodies great heartache. It is like the body. What means favor bodes disgrace? It is like trembling. Favor humiliates. Its acquisition causes trembling. Its loss causes trembling. This is meant by favor bodes disgrace. It is like trembling. What means rank bodes great heartache? It is like the body. I suffer great heartache because I have a body. When I have no body, what heartache remains? Therefore, who administers the empire as he takes care of his body can be entrusted with the empire. And our final translation goes like this. Favor and disgrace are alike to be feared, just as too great care or anxiety are bad for the body. Why are favor and disgrace alike to be feared? To be favored is humiliating. To obtain it is as much to be dreaded as to lose it. To lose favor is to be in disgrace, and of course is to be dreaded. Why are excessive care and great anxiety alike bad for one? The very reason I have anxiety is because I have a body. If I have not body, why would I be anxious? Therefore, if he who administers the empire esteems it as his own body, then he is worthy to be trusted with the empire. So, we want to avoid both favor and disgrace. This is because disgrace is the state in which you find yourself after falling from favor. It's the opposite of the former. If you have it, you'll be afraid of losing it, so you'll find yourself clinging to it. This isn't something that Lao Tzu would want us to be doing with our time. And then we're also told that care and anxiety are constructions of the personality, or the ego. We find ourselves attached to the concept of self. This very attachment is what makes care, anxiety, favor, and disgrace possible in the first place. So, in a way, if we are able to unattach ourselves from the personality, we may never have to deal with these mental constructions in the same way which we would under normal circumstances in everyday life. In the same way, physical distress can't even become a thing that exists unless there is a human body and human brain to interpret it as such. Lao Tzu says that one who regards themselves in this way is fit to rule a country. This individual would see the whole world of things and the world of other beings as his or her own body. At this level of existence, one is conducting oneself in the proper way, as Lao Tzu would put it, 
and therefore is fit to rule an empire. What a world we would live in if that was still the case today, huh? So here at the end would be a good time to point out some of the misconceptions that we might face when we read these chapters. It all seems very vague and abstract in a sense, especially the parts about figuring out a way to unattach oneself from the personality. There aren't any clear instructions in the book that describe any methods, practices, or more intensive philosophy about this. To me, this book takes larger topics and condenses or simplifies them in a way that is also pleasant to read. It's like poetry with a sort of religious flavor to it. And I think that's why we all find it so attractive in the first place, if we come to it as outsiders. So anyways, I think it's pretty well established by now in the world of science and in the world of philosophy that this so-called ego or self is just a dogma. It's something that we all accept and believe in since we haven't been able to prove its existence. Now this isn't to say that it's a bad thing or a stupid idea. Just because it's a fiction doesn't automatically mean that it's completely useless or evil or anything like that. Rather, this ego construct allows us to move around in the world, to get to meetings on time, have memories and have life experiences and everything else in between and after that, everything. Our belief in it has completely created the current state of the world that we live in today. All of our institutions are based on the belief in a self. Our political systems, especially democracy, our sense of art and beauty, all of this stuff is based on the idea that deep deep down there is some sort of a spark in each of us that we can find freedom in. It tells us how to make the big decisions in our lives. We find ourselves trying to connect with this inner self. We want to love ourselves and get to know ourselves, getting in touch with our emotions and our feelings. So it isn't something that we can just get rid of once and for all. The goal isn't to commit some sort of ego death by starving the mind of all thoughts and stimuli, uh, by sitting in a certain posture or focusing on an object. We wouldn't be able to perform our duties in the world, let alone enjoy a single moment of our fleeting time in the world. So rather than getting into all of that stuff, let's just try to get to a point where we can rationally understand that this self by which we all identify ourselves is a fiction. We can think of it as a focal point in which our bodies are sending us biochemical signals about our surroundings. At times we can remove some of the power that it holds over us and we can learn to stop taking it so seriously. Stepping aside from the ego isn't a state of mind that we want to be walking around in a hundred percent of the time like an enlightened being of some kind always a few inches off of the ground floating along through life on the contrary we can remember this in times of stress and hopefully get a bit of a laugh out of some of the some of the darker situations we find ourselves in at times i think really the point that i'm trying to make here is that as we know, we evolved to deal with however many types of life or death situations in the African savanna. Many of the instincts and mechanisms by which we survived in the world are still within us today in the modern world. They haven't changed. So at this stage of our evolution, we find that we're stuck in our heads much of the time during any given day. We take it so seriously and it drives us mad. We don't find ourselves any longer in a constant struggle against survival in the physical sense. Uh, we no longer find ourselves being preyed upon by lions or other animals that are larger than us. Our bodies and our minds haven't caught up to this yet, and we must now purposely step aside from the constructs in which we live in from time to time. 
so that at the end of the day we can see all of this for what it really is and really so that we can see ourselves for what we really are until next time